What this graph demonstrates that both the percentage of parents saying that they find being a parent is enjoyable or rewarding, highest among lower income people. A lot of people don't realize that when you define your personal goals around hedonism, like I am having a kid to be happier, that kid will always provide you with less happiness than if you are having a kid because it is your ideological duty to have the kid. The mm -hmm. happiness that you get from tasks that you do because you think they are a thing of intrinsic value and not to make yourself happy will always give you more durable happiness than the person who is chasing hedonism in and of itself. Mm -hmm. But the urban monoculture doesn't tell people that. It tells people that the highest order goal in anyone's life should be uh, uh, sort of the mass distribution of hedonism. Would you like to know more? Hello, Simone. You sent me an interesting graph today that I want to talk about because it speaks to a point that we often talk about within the prenatalist movement where we will say lower income individuals have more children than higher income individuals. Mm -hmm. This is true between and within countries. So that mm -hmm. means on average, the less wealth the country has, the more kids, the higher fertility rate is going to be. But also within countries, in general, like if you look at the U.S., until you get to like really extreme levels of wealth, which we've talked about in our other video, like the the will will ch child support cause speciation video, you do get a high fertility rate again at extreme levels of wealth. But generally, the less wealth you have, the more kids you have. And, and I think a lot of people, like especially like wealthier people when they hear us say this or like, oh, well, that's just because these terribly uneducated people are just miserably having children because of their dumb religious beliefs or because they're too dumb to use birth control properly. And they then would, I, of course, the assumption there is if that is really true, if that is what is happening, these are the most miserable parents, right? Of course, because they don't have the resources for the kids, right? Because yeah. raising a child is so expensive these days. Yes. And because of course they're having children by mistake because they're so dumb to not use birth control properly. So these wealthy parents, yeah, they're the ones who are having the fulfilling parenting experience. One would assume, it, of course, because they were, they, they paid all the IVF to have their children at age 55 and they wanted their children and well, they had I the resources. More than that, I think that there is a level of within the urban elite in our society today, this urban monoculture we talk about, mm -hmm. a dehumanization of the lower classes in, in America. <laughs> you think? Um, you think? Well, no, I mean, you say you think, but it's something that they, I do not think, realize that they have done. Well, um, especially the woke they, masses believe that they are the champions of the poor and uneducated. Yeah, well, that's what they say. They're like, yeah, I'm the champion of the little guy. And and then you... you, you, you you're like the little guy is 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 the people who you're like dehumanizing in these these you know and you see this in their language you know the 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 quote unquote uneducated and 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 the reality is is that they don't champion the little guy they no. are a group that defines I've never freaking themselves. met the little guy like the vast majority of these people <laughs> yeah they don't they don't care they don't have an understanding they they really and and their policies generally make things worse for the little guy and the little guy could tell them that but they just don't want to hear it what they want yeah. is centralized control and an expansion of the bureaucracy which is what they're really fighting for because this expanded bureaucracy increases the number of jobs that they can have which actually before we go into the graph that you sent me we'll go into a graph that i sent you that demonstrates this phenomenon this version of sex so this is the graph send graphs to each other and we're like oh look at my data Look at my data. This is a graph called growth in education staffing has far outpaced student enrollment. Oh, yes. When you, oh my gosh, you shared this to me the other day when I think yesterday when I was out in Harrisburg, right? And oh my yeah. God. So oh. if you look at since the 1970s, there has been an 8% increase in student enrollment in the US, a 60% increase in teaching staff, and a 138% increase in non-teaching staff. And this is something we're seeing in the university system as well and stuff like that. Wherever this ultra progressive movement has concentrated itself, they expand the number of jobs that are in these essentially like cash for nothing programs, right? Like and let's be very uh, clear. There is no correlation between this and improved student outcomes. Yes. Oh, and this is really true. If you look at like the amount of money going into school systems and stuff like that, anybody who is telling you we will pump more money into the school system and get higher outcomes is just not 
relating to the data that we have right now. Um, no, and if, if there were massive reform in the public school system, this could theoretically be possible. But right now, putting money to the school system means giving money to teachers unions means basically feeding the bureaucracy and the adults, not the children. So but we're the not saying that is like- it's important for this quote unquote educated class ruling, that, yes, that yeah. believes that they deserve basically a dole from the state for existing. And then when, you know, I love it. So many people, they grow up so much in this class that you're now getting like this, like anti-work movement and stuff like that, where they're like even horrified that the idea that humans have to work for a living because they have been grown up expecting that each and every one of them is so upper class in their expectations that they get to They're live in the land of gentry. Yeah, no, it is Although, it is completely insane. It is it is well, and, and keep in mind, what they really mean when they say no work is they mean no work for the college educated. They still expect someone to support them. They well, still expect because the, yeah, someone has to deliver their food. Who's gonna do their DoorDash? Who's gonna like, those their are really humans to them? Like they genuinely, I do not think see these people as humans. Um, no, 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 like literally though. Oh my God, Malcolm, because I I just spent like the uh, I just spent the past more than two weeks every <laughs> afternoon out door knocking, freaking mm -hmm. cold. And the way that people treat you when you are like someone who knocks on their door, it is insane. And I'm like, I'm heavily pregnant now. And it's obvious. It is, it is completely wild. Just, yeah, like strangers or, or people seen as like delivery people. And you know what though? Like the, you know, who was the one consistent group of people when I was out door knocking, who was incredibly nice to me and who always who? wished me luck? Delivery people. Oh. <laughs> They're like, hey, what are you up to? You know, and I'm like, oh, I'm doing this. I'm like, hey, good luck. You know, I, I don't live in your district, but you'd have my vote. You know, just it's so weird, this striation. And then I also saw mm -hmm. how the delivery people were treated by the people in the neighborhoods I was walking around, just like me. It, yeah. it is wild. Yeah. So just, yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but, but it is shocking because you have this art student and you're like, you, you could become a delivery person. They're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. I am above that kind of work. I uh, yeah. have this degree that's now made pointless by AI. But hold on. So let's get to this graph that you shared with me because it was pretty surprising even to me. I mean, I'll admit that I was to some extent affected by this bias. That, that when is people... And I think another reason why you are affected by it is if, for example, we look at the fertility crash in Latin America and we see analysts saying, oh, well, the reason why fertility is crashing is because all these unwanted children aren't, be ha aren't being had by these teen mothers in Latin America and therefore blah, 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 which implies that the people who had a lot of kids in the past really weren't ready to have them, really didn't want to have them, weren't, you know, this was not their thing. Mm -hmm. So you would assume that there's a lot of misery around this. You know, we just, the, everywhere the data implies well, that. Hold on, this data comes from the US. And so I think that you're seeing something different here. No, I no, well, yes, because this is, we're talking about now and we're talking about the US. And, and, and as we point out, yeah, like more lower income people have more kids, but yeah. So let's go over this graph, okay. what this graph demonstrates. And of course it's not profound, but it shows that both the percentage of parents saying that they find being a parent is enjoyable or rewarding, the highest among lower income people. So 38% of lower income people and 36% of lower income people find parenting to be either enjoyable or rewarding all the time. 38 and 36 respectively. You um, no, you're getting, sorry. Oh, sorry, and sorry, thir 38, 38 and 43%. So 38%, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll read the graph here. Thanks, yeah, go ahead. 38% of lower income individuals find being a parent enjoyable all the time. And 49% um, in addition to that, so 86% of lower income people in total find being a parent very enjoyable all of the time or most of the time. Now, if you contrast this with upper income people, instead of 38% all of the time, it is 14% all of the time for upper income people. Wild. And with middle income people, it's only 21% all of the time. Yeah. And you also see lower total levels of all of the time or most of the time. So in contrast with the 86% of lower income people that find being a parent enjoyable all of the time or most of the time, you only have 79% within the upper income community. Now, if we talk about the amount that find it rewarding, you actually have about the same rate uh, across all groups, if you're talking about all of the time or most of the time, it's 80, 79, 81. So yeah. within one point of each other. But when you talk about all of the time, do they find it rewarding all of the time? 
the number of lower income people that find it rewarding all the time is 43 percent mm -hmm. contrast it with tw only 28 percent in the upper income community mm -hmm. uh, so what you're really seeing here is upper income people seem to pretty dramatically and markedly find parenting both less enjoyable and less rewarding yeah um, and you know if i were to like let's say this graph was presented to us with only the numbers and not the income levels you know they're like okay well now put the incomes i would first thing to just invert it, right? Because everyone's, oh, well, the reason why people can't become parents, the reason why people are miserable as parents is they don't have enough money. They don't have enough money. And yet, look at this. Look at this enjoyable well, and rewarding. So I think that there's a few things going on here. The first one is one that often isn't talked about, but I do not think that it is totally causal, the correlation between income and parenting. I think that there is a correlational element here. Which is to say that if you're the type of person that values family and parenting more, you are going to spend more time on doing that uh, than on maximizing your personal income streams. Oh, well, no, no. okay. So there's a there's a different, the, the, the causation moves in the different direction. You're not having more kids because you're poor. You're poor because you're having more kids. Like the Weasleys. Um, well, because you have different life priorities. Yeah, yeah. Like you're, you're spending your time raising family instead of, you know... Pulling well, it's not just days. how you're spending your time. It's how you structure your life. So mm, a good example yeah. of this would be us. Okay. Yeah. I have a <laughs> from Stanford. It's, it's for people outside of the world of degrees. It's probably literally the hardest degree to get into in the world. It's much harder to get out than a Harvard MBA, for example. And MBAs are much harder to get than PhDs. I remember one person, it was like, you implied you had a graduate degree from Stanford, which which, you, which made me think you had a neuroscience PhD from Stanford because you said you had a neuroscience degree. Um, and that's obviously a lie, like a scam. And I got very frustrated with this because I could have gotten a neuroscience. It would have been astronomically easier to get into the neuroscience PhD program at Stanford than a Stanford MBA. Like and it's less not expensive. If it, it's, it's literally probably about, if you're talking about the, the, the difficulty, the difference between. Oh no, no, their entrance rates are. Community college and getting Google into entrance college. rates, just Google entrance rates. Yeah. It, it's, it. Well, it's, it's not only that, but if you look at like the average scores you need and stuff like that. Yeah. So I, I was frustrated by that. But what I'm saying is I could demand a very high salary. Simone has a graduate degree from Cambridge. Like we could demand incredibly high salaries if we wanted to play that game, if we wanted to live in like Manhattan and San Francisco, but we didn't. We moved to rural Pennsylvania, right? Like we we live on a farm, right? Like we, we do what we can and, and we're, the our, our education skills and network gives us some level of financial security that a lot of people wouldn't have but we would probably be considered middle income people i think when i look at the stats or upper middle income family whereas we certainly wouldn't need to do that we, we are that because we are optimizing around what we value which is is really important a lot of these people who the the chart is looking at is lower income might just be general genuinely like they're living in a suburban or rural area where their income is intrinsically going to be less than if they're living in an urban area because of cost of living for example mm -hmm. but and that that's enables them to have more kids yeah allowing them to have more kids so i think that that's one component that we're seeing here mm -hmm. but then the other component i think we're seeing could be and this is the component that would be for the, the other side of the argument it could be that high wealth individuals have access to more compelling competing tasks. Um, oh, sources of enjoyment and meaning. Meaning that like when you are lower income, like you won't, you can't take fancy trips. You can't engage in charity. You can't join a board and become a big, big fancy person. So, but, but, so this is where I disagree with it. I really don't think that that many things that you could otherwise do are limited when you're lower income. Yeah. To be honest, there really isn't, this is something that one of the- And lower income first, people are super involved in their communities. For example, when you look at rates of giving to charity and like proportional <laughs> charity donations, lower income people give the most. Yeah. So this is my roommate when I was at business school. He, smartest person I've ever met, I, I think. Like just a genuine, one of my favorite moments with him is the- there was this guy in, in the classroom who was talking about building his app company. And he, was a, he was a guest speaker. Yeah, he was a guest speaker. And 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 my roommate, I'm not going to say his name or anything because he's a very private person. And he does a lot of what he does through like shell companies. So people don't know that it's all him. But the guest speaker 
was like, he said, he had said something about how to get like, how their system for ranking apps works and stuff like that. And at that time, and, it was and, like, and, and, hold on, hold on. Like app store, right? Yeah, right. And and he like just dis dismissed him. He's, I'm sorry, you, you misunderstand the system. This is how it works. And then the guy said snarkily to him, he goes, how many top 10 Apple app store apps have you had? And he goes, how many do I have on the top 10 list today? Um, <laughs> and the guy was just floored because he, he programs them and well, he's got a number of shell company he uses to program them, but really smart guy. But we were talking to him about wealth at one point because he just has an enormous amount of wealth, very humble guy. And he was complaining. He's like, I don't understand the point of being wealthy anymore. Do you remember? He's like, all of the things that I used to have exclusive or historically I would have had exclusive access to as an ultra wealthy person. I, 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 what I can't, I don't have a private driver anymore. Like the, you have Uber now, right? Like anyone can have like basically a private driver on demand. I don't have, what was it like food delivered to me anymore? Anyone can do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, he was going through all of the things like just entertainment, like all these like customized services, hiring someone at the drop of a hat to do something for you as an assistant. Oh, I'll just use Upwork. Yeah. 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 Or, oh, you know, what, what do I have a band in my house? I can listen to any band in the world, wherever, you know, constantly playing. And he was just going through all of the exclusive things that used to be the realm of the ultra wealthy and the ultra elite, which mm -hmm. are now generally accessible to everyone. Yeah. In fact, when I look at the wealth gated hobbies right now, a lot of them either suck i don't know like sailing or skiing or, or polo yeah no one actually wants to do that <laughs> no, it's more like a status signal thing yeah. or they are hobbies where honestly the the expenditure of meaningless wealth is part of the point of the hobby so hmm. here is collecting would come into a big part of this. I'm talking to you, you Warhammer figure collectors and stuff <laughs> like that. Um, you, you, no, it's true. You know, all of these collectibles, all of these, you know, uh, I, I guess, you know, whatever, like the things you're going to conferences to and you're buying all these baubles, which have a, a increased price due to the scarcity, due to all of the people who are collecting them. Yeah. Um, the... Yeah, I mean, I think about the hobbies that I have. I'm like, what competes with my time with the kids, right? Writing, which like, I guess <laughs> I love writing. I've been having so much fun writing recently. So that's one <laughs> thing that's not like a wealth gated thing at all. And yeah. video games. Um, and video games are one of those things where somebody might be like, well, video games have been rising in price recently. And I'm like, if you contrast video game prices today with what they were when we were kids, you know, a new video game when we were kids used to cost 50 bucks. What you are not taking into account is inflation. I remember I was talking with Simone during the pandemic where I was always shocked that video game prices were rising so much more slowly than they were. <laughs> you have video games now where you'll get AAA games that are selling for $70 or something like that now, $75. Uh, for the base game, which is more than they used to sell for. Yeah, but I'm sorry. Super Bowl tickets are now $9,000. Getting into Disneyland is like $4,000. Sorry, $400. Yeah, it's, it's, really you know. my enjoyment of it because another thing that's changed with video games is also the indie game scene. And frankly, mm -hmm. I find the AAA games to be a lot less enjoyable than they used to be and the indie games to be a lot more enjoyable. And they're even cheaper than games used to be. And now you have things like Epic Store that's giving out like a free new, often pretty good game, like every yeah. year a couple. Yeah. It, it's not particularly a wealth gated hobby. So I'm thinking like, where are these wealth gated things that are, they don't exist? Yeah, well, it, basically in other words, yeah, I don't think that that second hypothesis- well, hold on, I like... want to be clear about this point because people okay. might be misunderstanding me. Yeah. When people don't have a lot of wealth, there are things that they don't have access to that wealthy people do have access to. But those things are not in the category of entertainment. They mm. are in the categories typically of personal safety, personal health, mm -hmm. personal ability to do something like, I guess, travel the world on a dime or, or not have to work. But all of those things don't fall into this category of competing for their entertainment daily time exactly so anyway yeah that was really interesting to me sorry yeah i just I, I mean the most important thing that i wanted to point out by doing a podcast on this is just that you think that lower income people who are having more kids are doing this by mistake and miserable no they they're finding this extremely satisfying and i mean i think a lot of that's i mean a lot of the people well, i'm having... gonna make a different hypothesis i think i know what the actual answer is but i want to hear what you were saying gonna say 
I, I think that there is also a correlation between higher levels of we'll say faith, and that could be a hard culture. Any sort of any harder culture weirdly correlates with lower income. And I, I can't really say why. Maybe lower income leaves more room in your like head for faith. But I, I think that that's probably a big correlatory factor is people of faith in hard cultures are more likely to be pronatalist, are more likely to find the enjoyment and meaning of having kids. And people who are wealthier are far more likely to be part of the urban monoculture and therefore be, if anything, negative utilitarian antinatalists at heart who I have children, but then kind of do with this, but I think really? you're, you're hitting on the fundamental point. Okay. Um, so what is it? Wealthier people are statistically much more likely to be in the urban monoculture than less wealthy people. Um, Wasn't that what I was just saying? Well, no, because you were saying that the alternative was faith. And I'm saying the alternative isn't faith. It's just not being in the urban monoculture. <laughs> now, it often looks like faith, okay? Faith is one component of this. But you need to keep in mind, if you're less wealthy, regardless of your group, so even if you're a less wealthy Democrat, for example, right, mm -hmm. you are often not going to be in the urban monoculture. You're going to be in your local often like a minority ethnic community. Like you're going to be ingrained with your local Hispanic, you know, often like Catholic church and family network or your local black community or your local. And these culturally are very different from the urban monoculture, even when you are on this democratic side. And then when you're not on the democratic side, you know, it's not an issue. And so I think what we're really seeing here is that the urban monoculture has created a cultural system for relating to children where they are basically treated like pets and children are very high maintenance pets. If, if you are getting children like pets- Children like if, suck as pets, but they really do. They suck as pets. Well, when this is, yeah, this is one of the things that I, you know, I talk about here is sometimes the way to be happiest, and this is one of the things we talk about on our podcast, like you can see being happy, being unhappy is a sin, our episode on, on, on that concept, which is, a lot of people don't realize that when you define your personal goals around hedonism, like I am having a kid to be happier, that kid will always provide you with less happiness than if you are having a kid because it is your ideological duty to have the kid. The mm -hmm. happiness that you get from tasks that you do because you think they are a thing of intrinsic value and not to make yourself happy will always give you more durable happiness than the person who is chasing hedonism in and of itself. Mm -hmm. But the urban monoculture doesn't tell people that. It tells people that the highest order goal in anyone's life should be uh, uh, sort of the mass distribution of hedonism. So first, do what makes you happy and then try to increase pleasure and reduce suffering in others. So you're saying the very nature of the cultural monoculture makes it difficult to actually enjoy having kids and ha find having kids rewarding because it does detract from in the moment pleasure. Well, yeah, because because chasing after pleasure, defining your life around pleasure, I, I, I both your own pleasure and the pleasure of other people's sort of disables your ability to really feel genuine pleasure. And I think that that's what's happening here. But then I also think that there's all of these, you know, we talk about like the psychologist cult and everything like that. I think the way that these individuals, when they're in deep in the urban monoculture, relate to mental health and frame their own mental health around questions like trauma, the way they interact with things is just really unhealthy. And it causes them to interact with their kids in really unhealthy ways. Uh, they, and they hurt their kids ultimately, which does well, as you talked about, they, me. they treat their kids like little princelings. Well, and well, and but then they also apply this whole trauma mindset to their children. And we've met, it's so interesting. Um we, we keep meeting young people, right? And then we've we've met a decent number of young people from both more conservative, traditional religious communities, as well as super woke communities. And it's so funny. I, I'm, I'm thinking of two people in particular. One is like super to the point, like super regulated. I, I've never heard about anything ever that happened that was difficult in her life or anything like that. Just, you know, mm -hmm. her comments and thoughts on things. And then I'm thinking about the other one. And every single time I talk, there's some mention of trauma or difficulty or ideology, actually, which is really interesting. And it just shows how, like, how screwed up this culture is and how it's creating people who are miserable. 
So I, I no, mean, you really allow your kids to engage with this culture of, I, I don't know what to call it. It's a culture that had disseminated from the psychology community, mm. which was my originally, I started my career as a neuroscientist and I worked in psychiatry. And, and so I'm saying this as somebody who is informed about how the community is structured and the way it works and the way the human brain works. It is really much more structurally similar to a cult now what what is taught as psychology than it is to historically what we called psychology it's it's actually much closer to what scientology was in the 80s than than what any real evidence based psychology is um and we have episodes on this psychology cult episode stuff like that but it has disseminated into all aspects of how these individuals in the urban monoculture see themselves mm -hmm. and relate to their own self narrative and when a kid is raised in this, and it's funny that the two people who you mentioned were girls, and I thought you were thinking of two guys who I know who had the same phenomenon. Happen oh my now. God, you're right. No, I'm now I'm thinking of those two guys, the two young. Yeah, but I was thinking of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh and it's God. really sad because these are really otherwise competent individuals. Smart pe well, all of these people, yeah, are equally, I think they all have the equal like potential as humans. And yet one of these groups, like, we, we've given up on their futures, honestly. Like, we've just been no, like, no, okay, no, we're writing them off. Yeah, I, we've basically written them off. I'm going to be yeah. honest, yeah. Well, um, and it's interesting, the smart ones, like, the, when I think about the smart people who are in each of these groups that I know, the, the and I, I think that people here, when we're talking about, like, conservative young people, they, they probably think that we're talking about I don't know, like white, what they would think of as traditional, like, uh, I, I don't know, like tradcast. Everyone <laughs> I'm thinking about it, the first generation immigrant descendant. Yeah. Those are the most- Or, or, or children, uh, uh, some are children of first generation immigrants. And that's what I'm saying. The ones who I'm thinking of, oh, the woke ones? Yeah. I don't know any woke- Oh, you do? Okay. Well, yeah, then I don't know the one you're thinking of. But generally, the first generation immigrant kids who I know are less affected by wokeness because they're still, you know, well, I think they kids. have the ability to see, in contrast to their home culture, just how like ridiculous and unhinged woke culture is. Yeah. And they're like, no, this is ridiculous. And then the ones who I know who have really succumbed to it, their families have been here for generations. Yeah. And they, they succumbed to what culture and they had so much promise, but honestly, more than like 50% of their mental effort seems dedicated to maintaining quote unquote mental health, which oh, is God, really yeah. just degradating of mental health. Like just do yourself, get it. Like, like the, the elevation of, of this sort of mental landscape that has come with this mental health expansion within our, our society, it's both unnecessary and causes more mental health issues. It also like, pulls people totally off their career track. Like I, I, you see all these people now who like want to be life coaches or want to be therapists or want to go into all these sorts of, they just want to feed into this because it's all mm -hmm. they're ever thinking about. And so then they're they're becoming unproductive. They're not getting jobs. Like they're they're not getting well paying jobs. It's it's awful. And they're also putting themselves into huge amounts of student debt to get degrees. <sighs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's 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 an, and I think very really an addictive process. Yeah. For um, sure. And it's interesting to me because uh, people know that I really love studying religions, but my love of studying religions really came from a love of studying cults. I always wanted to understand how do people get enthralled by these ideas that seem just completely pointless and feckless? And how do we control our own minds? That was something that I always really cared about. I was like, well... Right. If a cult can make you give all your money to strangers and do all these crazy things, well, then what could cult tactics make you do if you if you leverage them for good to do what you actually want? Yeah, like, could I brainwash myself? Could I create a little, yeah. like, like, my own mental landscape that would do well and move me towards efficaciousness and happiness? Yeah, seeing as powerful cult tactics are, totally, you should be thinking that. Well, I, I believe I've executed on it within my own life. I'm quite, quite happy with my life as everybody always comments on. They're like, well, it I'm is wild. Yeah, happy. everyone is, is he on drugs or is this an act? And it's no, this is just, I mean, by the way, guys, this is Malcolm at his low point. He has been up since 2 a.m. He is exhausted and tired now. You should see him first thing in the morning. I mean, my God. Oh, yeah. I am very high energy first thing in the morning. We've had some interviews. The Chris Williamson interview was me earlier in the morning. If people <laughs> want to be like, what is Malcolm like when he's like earlier in the morning? <laughs> you know, I get really excited about everything. Or right after I've completed a task I'm really excited about. So I think that you can actually 
brainwash yourself basically not brainwash yourself because it's it's really just you choose your mental landscape much more than people realize Mm -hmm. and when you act like your mental landscape is something that you don't have complete authority over and, and and that you are not the the authoritarian dictator of your mental landscape i love these people they're like oh i'm listening to all the little voices in my head and i'm trying to create what's the word I'm looking for some sort of balance or harmony among them you know this this push by like inside out and stuff like that don't listen to them they're um, wrong you are, you are not the slave of your emotions you, yeah. the emotions are the slave of your logic your logic is the dictator of your mental landscape and if uh, you want to feel happy then you feel happy because you've got bigger things than feeling good about yourself and and we really we are dealing with a collapsing society right now we cannot afford these types of emotional indulgences and, and part of the reason society is collapsing is because so many people are indulging these emotional indulgences actually very interesting if you look at historical periods right before societal collapses you see a similar sort of mental healthism under different names among the what like temperance or what oh the oh the vapors you know i can barely think right now oh Oh, no 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 yes 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 the the hypochondriac women who are always swooning and they have these mysterious illnesses etc or or always yeah competing in these these sort of mental games or writing long poems about how mentally anguished they were right and how they yeah Goodness gracious. Well, I mean, so my takeaway from this graph is basically this this thought that being pure and being a parent will make you miserable is like just off that, you know, lower income parents are, (laughs) there are clearly fewer low income parents who don't find any rewarding enjoyment from parenting than wealthy people. And it's so funny, like when I actually look at you know, the lower income families we know who are parents. And I, I look at how they are around their kids when we hang out in person. And I also just like look at your their Facebook posts. And then I think of the higher income parents that we know and their children. I see how they act around them and speak about them and post about them. It it actually kind of checks out. There's a lot more sort of like cognitive dissonance around being a parent with the wealthy in some way. And also maybe this feeling like they're kind of above raising them. So that like time spent with them is kind of like, you know, it, it's 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 very hard for me to articulate this. But anyway, it, it does shape the way that I, I look at pronatalism and income. And I mean, it certainly reinforces our thing, which is, yeah, this whole money, please approach to pronatalism is incredibly dumb. But yeah, I'm glad that you indulged me in talking about this graph. <laughs> I love you to death, Simone. You are a wonderful wife. You are a dapper and perfect husband. I love you so much.